So today, I, I won't waste a lot of time because first of all, after this talk, Michael has to work his way uh, back to New York. Uh, <laughs> maybe not today, maybe tomorrow, if we don't know. It could be the whole damn week, so we'll see. Uh, so we are actually very fortunate that uh, at least he was able to come down here. I know on Friday we were considering whether we would uh, postpone this or cancel it. And then we agreed that okay, he should fly yesterday uh, to DC. Then when he comes here, we evaluate the situation on the ground. <laughs> and, uh, I think everything turns out that at least it's, it's manageable. And, and so we're going to move on. So today he's going to uh, address or talk about the, his journey. Because many have talked, it's not about talking about a specific science topic, it's about the journey. Uh, you know, he started all the way from Ukraine. And then towards the end of uh, early 90s, 92, Michael, I think, you know, he came here to, to NASA Goddard at the Gis, and he has been around for quite a long time, you know, 22 or 23 years uh, now. So most of us who have been uh, working with him for quite a while know that he is one of the leading lights in the uh, light scattering and radiative transfer. And uh, without a doubt, he has made immense contribution to uh, its application in remote sensing. So today he's going to tell us his journey, how he has come all the way from Ukraine to here, and uh, all the contribution he has made over the years. Now, one thing I thought I should highlight is that uh, if you look at the number of publications Michael has been doing, to him, every year he has to do like five papers. First of all, not talking about being a second or third or whatnot, but every year it's like a norm, you know? And, and some years, good years, you can go all the way to eight or nine publications. So very impressive record. So please, with that short introduction, help me to welcome our speaker, Michael Mishenko. Um, thank you, Charles, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for being here, given the weather conditions. Uh, this is uh, extraordinary. Uh, this is a great opportunity. And especially because Charles, when he invited me, he said, Michael, you should be as provocative as you can be. And I can be, so if you find me too provocative, you know who to blame. Um, this talk, I thought, you know, what should it be about? It should be about physics, uh, because this is my background, and I graduated from the uh, Department of General and Applied Physics, uh, uh, the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. This is the best picture, unfortunately, I could, I could find on the web. This is not representative of the entire institute. Uh, this department, at the time was definitely one of the best in the world. I don't know what its rating is uh, today, but the entire uh, philosophy of this institute was really unique, at least in the Soviet Union. Science in the Soviet Union and still now in Russia and Ukraine mostly is done at uh, research institutes of the Academy of Sciences, not at universities. And really a, a signature organization of this institute was that after three years of basic training, Every student was assigned to an institute uh, of the Academy of Sciences. And for another three years, we would study and do science at the same time, which was really productive. And so by the time we graduated, we would have publications and we would presumably know how to do science. This was my base organization. Probably some of you have seen this uh, gigantic building on the Kalushka Avenue in Moscow. So this is where I started. Uh, atmospheric optics from the standpoint of uh, physics. Uh, and I learned a simple fact, similarly simple, uh, if you deal with atmospheric radiation, it is electromagnetic radiation, and it is described by one of the electrodynamics disciplines. At the very bottom of this hierarchy of complexity, of course, is macroscopic electrodynamics. At the very top of it is quantum electrodynamics. So my internal postulate was, as, as long as it is about radiation, it must be also about electromagnetics. Um, when I came to the main astronomical observatory in Kiev, uh, this postulate was really questioned in my mind. So this is why I did my PhD uh, under the supervision of Dr. Yanovitsky and this graph traces my radiative transfer lineage, which goes all the way uh, back to the famous uh, Soviet astrophysicist, uh, Ambert Sumyan. Uh, indeed, Dianovitsky was my supervisor, but his supervisor was academician Sobolev, uh, 
who did his PhD and uh, uh, academician Ambert Sumyans. So I'm, I'm the grand grandson of Ambert Sumyans, in some sense. And to prove that, uh, I own, own this uh, copy of the so-called Blue Sobolev. It's a famous book in Russia on radiative transfer. It's blue because it is blue, uh, the Russian edition. It was translated into English uh, in 1975. So the copy that I have has two inscri inscriptions uh, in it. The first one is from Sobolev to Yanovitsky, and the second one is from Yanovitsky to myself. He gave me this copy in 1992, just before I was about to move to, to the United States. And this encryption says, uh, learn from others while being proud of yourself. So very inspiring. So then at the main astronomical observatory, I studied uh, several uh, benchmark sources on radio transfer, starting with this multiple light scattering book by uh, Van der Hulst. Um, I don't know if everybody knows that, but in 1962, uh, Van der Hill spent a sabbatical at GIS. Uh, it was the pre-Jim Hansen time. Uh, and the result of that stay uh, at GIS was, is this one of the most famous publications on, on radiated transfer on the adding doubling method. Uh, of course, also started the, the single scattering book by Van der Hulst, and this is the Russian translation of it, which I uh, read at the time. And finally, there was an, another essential source. It's the uh, uh, Review in Space Science Reviews by Hansen and Travis. This, of course, a recent uh, picture of Jim uh, getting arrested. And this is an older picture of, of Larry Travis. Uh, so when I started these sources, uh, I was developing this internal conflict in my mind. On one hand, I knew that radiation means electromagnetics. On the other hand, from these publications, I learned that you can avoid using electromagnetics if you want to deal with radiative transfer because all you need is the energy conservation law and the back of an envelope on which you can scribble a simple, physically obvious derivation of this radiative transfer equation. Even more than that, even the kernel of this equation, you can avoid calculating it from any physics because there was this famous heaney greenstein phase function developed by astrophysicists and you can be happy for the rest of your life just dealing with these two formulas. Well, even if you needed polarization, the way to introduce it was to say, okay, you take the intensity and you replace the scalar by this four, column, four element column and the phase function by this four by four phase matrix, et cetera. So it was really straightforward, but there's no physics. And you know, I was really conflicted inside. And this conflict was only exacerbated by reading this famous book by Akira Ishimaru uh, published in 1978, I read this 18, 1981 uh, Russian translation. And he was pretty explicit in this book by saying that the, the scalar radiative transfer equation can be derived in two ways. One, using the back of an envelope, and second, using the scalar theory of wave scattering. Well, uh, so you can avoid using physics, and you can use physics, and you get the same result. You know, that was really perplexing. But at the time, I was doing my PhD, and we all know that doing PhD is more important than doing science. Um, so I had to deal with what I had. Uh, you know, dealing with the scalar radiative transfer equation was, uh, you know, I thought it was boring uh, because, you know, a lot was, that was done. And the vector equation was much more attractive. So what I did was to develop a, a nice computer program to cal calculate uh, the phase uh, matrix entering this equation based on the me theory. So the particles are homogeneous spherical particles. It's a nice uh, theory which you know, can be traced back to uh, Couchet, Riberich, Domke, Sievert, uh, Havanier, and, and Van der May. Um, and then I developed a, an invariant embedding technique to solve this equation, and I applied both to the analysis of ground-based observations of, of Jupiter. So it was exciting, it was astrophysics, and that went well. But after that, you know, there was time to go back to philosophy and think what I, what I really wanted to do in, in science. Uh, even if it is just this equation, the vector radiative transfer equation, what else can we do? Uh, we did it for spherical particles, but we know that the majority of particles, at least all solid particles, are non spherical. Uh, there was some religious belief that all non spherical particles are equivalent to spherical particles. The only problem was to find that spherical particle that would provide this equivalence. But in reality, it would be nice to be able to compute light scattering by these particles 
explicitly. Uh, at the time, the, essentially the only game in town, and this was 1986, 1987, was the so-called ray tracing approximation. And when I looked at it, I finally realized what was really bothering me is, even though it is called an approximation, it's not real an approximation. It, it, this is what you would call a, an ad hoc approximation. You don't start with the Maxwell equations and you don't proceed in a systematical way to arrive at the ray tracing technique. What you do is you kind of combine together really disparate parts. The reflection of a plane electromagnetic wave by a semi-infinite medium with the plane interface and the diffraction of the electromagnetic wave by a black circular screen. These are totally different problems and how to combine them, in, you know, all you can do is to use physical obviousness or wishful thinking, you can call it whatever you want. So I didn't like this. Uh, and I now call this an ad hoc approximation and this is what its gist is. The starting point is not a fundamental rigorous physical equation. It's, it, it's a combination of derivative physical concepts borrowed from different aspects of electromagnetic scattering. And to stitch this all together, these really remotely parts, you, you really need to, to have these simple physical considerations or you know, arguments like it is physically obvious that or everybody knows that and this is typical of textbooks. And then the students believe that, yes, if it is obvious, my professor knows it is, he's smart. I don't see any obviousness, but I'm not as smart as my professor, so I believe him. And you end up with a numerical scheme which you know, works, but you never know what the accuracy is or the range of applicability. On the other hand, you can also come up with the classification of another type of approximation. You can call it analytical. In this case, you do start with the rigorous equation and you identify a small parameter and you go all, all the way analytically by neglecting all powers of this small parameter higher than one. And this is a legitimate approximation because you know what the range of applicability of it is going to be. Uh, and it can be pretty safe. Now, one example of an ad hoc approximation is the scale radiator tra uh, transfer equation. Because people say, well, we have this general vector equation, but we're not interested in polarization. All we need is the specific intensity. So let's neglect all elements of the phase matrix except the one one element. And ne let's neglect all elements of the specific intensity column vector except the first one. We get this scale approximation, but this is not a derivation. This is really saying, I want to solve this equation and I hope that this solution will be meaningful. So, you know, in this process of philosophical thinking and studying a lot of literature, I came up with these uh, three rules of research. Uh, if a first principle solution is available, then don't use any approximation. Use this uh, first principle solution directly based on physics because this is a very reliable way. This will never get obsolete. Well, if this first principle solution is not available, we have to use an approximation. Make sure that what you use is an analytical approximation. And the third rule, if an analytical approximation is not available, then switch to something else. <laughs> but we know that uh, quite often we cannot afford that. So we have to use a, a, an ad hoc approximation. And this, this voice telling you don't do that because this will come back and you know, bite you on you know what? But, you know, despite this voice, you have to act as a professional. So there's uh, rule number four. And this is, you know, I, I've done that a couple of times and, you know, I kind of regret that. But anyway, um, so after studying what was available in terms of the uh, first principle solutions of the Maxwell equations for spherical particles, really there were three games in town uh, besides the uh, ray tracing technique. The so-called T-matrix method developed by Peter Waterman, the Dyskidiapol approximation uh, developed by Parcel and Penny Packer, and they find a difference time domain uh, technique developed by K and Yi. I, I couldn't find his picture on the web. Um, so all of them were developed at, at about the same time, and all of them were essentially not used, simply because the computers weren't fast enough, and the techniques, you know, they were raw techniques, um, not uh, very efficient, and I had to choose from those three, and this is like a lottery. You have to choose without having all the information available because most of the information you're supposed to generate yourself eventually. So you pick one and then you're stuck with it. 
Now, this is a big investment of time and, uh, and energy. Uh, and what really moved me at the time, I received this uh, uh, report by uh, Wiskam and Muniai, published in 1986, and this was really a challenge because, you know, this is a quote from that report on light sketching with this fancy uh, cherish of particles. 15 years of Cray time. The computer I had was probably 100, maybe 200 times slower than Cray. Uh, and no matter how much time you want to spend on it, this switched off electricity at night and you, you, you probably, you know, your job disappears anyway. Uh, so that was a good challenge. Uh, and he used the T-matrix method in, in his report. Um, and the, here's this book by Tsang et al, uh, The Theory of Microwave Remote Sensing, in which the T-matrix technique was described in all the detail. So this is all I needed, and especially what I liked about this technique is its analytical, mathematical nature. For example, uh, the incident and scattered fields are expanded in so-called vectorspherical wave functions. And if you look at these wave functions, they're really nice mathematically. You know, you rotate your coordinate system and they transform in a very nice and predictable way and the special functions involved have very nice mathematical properties. So I decided, okay, probably this is something to use, especially because when you have a non-spherical particle, it can be in a specific orientation and it can be in another orientation and you're not interested in either one of them. You need a particle which is randomly oriented. So you need to average over orientations and in any technique, this is what takes 99% of, of of the CPU time. What if you can do this orientation analytically? You know, that would be a big boost. And this is precisely what I found out. Yes, with the T-matrix method, you can do that, just owing to the analytical, nice analytical properties of these functions. So I wrote a computer program. I ran it on my archaic computer, and I was able to reproduce all results from the Wiscombe's report uh, within just a couple of hours. That was exciting. So uh, I submitted a paper to, uh, to the Journal of the Optical Society of America, A, in 1990. And the reviewer said, well, this is a nice mathematical approach. And mathematics is beautiful and the paper should be published, except delete that statement that this analytical technique increases the efficiency of the technique by two or three orders of magnitude because it is impossible. You, you are misleading yourself and, and the readers. So I had to do some convincing. So finally they had to accept this fact because they could run the same, uh, they could use the same computer to run two different programs and just to, to see for themselves uh, what was going on. Uh, and then uh, in collaboration with Dan Mikowski, we generalized this analytical leveraging uh, method uh, to uh, particles in the form of clusters of particles, not just compact, homogeneous, single body particles, but also to these aggregates, which of course you can find in nature in many cases. This was done in 1995. At that time I was already at GIS. Uh, I came to GIS in 1992. Uh, so we published this paper and, and then we put all these programs on the web. And that was a major investment of time because you know, you, you put something on the web, you'll be snowed under an avalanche of, of requests for clarifications, statements that you're stupid and your program doesn't work, and, and on and on and on. So we did write very extensive user guides to minimize that uh, clarification time. And it, this kind of worked uh, over the years. And, and these programs have been used, this is probably not the full count. This is as far as I know, in more than a thousand peer-reviewed publications, which I think is, is a pretty good outcome uh, given the relatively low uh, investment on the part of NASA. This didn't cost much. Uh, we summarized this also in a book, uh, and uh, this book eventually was translated into Chinese. But this research on single scattering shows you that light scattering is so ubiquitous, and if you do something good about it, it will find applications not just in astrophysics, planetary physics, or climate research, it will be used everywhere. Uh, and so uh, publications on which I'm the first you know, author or a co-author have been cited in 635 different journals. Uh, and these are, you know, some of the titles of the journals, and they can be pretty exotic uh, in many cases. Um, so that is single scattering, so to speak, because we call it single scattering, and we believe that the, these media, clouds and particular surfaces and vegetation, are multiple scattering media. You know, this is not true, because for the Maxwell equations, this cloud as much a, sing, a single scatterer as a single droplet, when it is totally isolated, 
all you do for this cloud, you formulate the Maxwell equations and the boundary conditions, except the boundary now is extremely complex. It involves the individual boundaries of each of the, of the droplets. Uh, so these are single scattering objects, but we call them multiple scattering objects. So how to go about them? If we use the radiator transfer equation, which at the time was an ad hoc approximation, are we safe or not? Where is any evidence that the radiator transfer equation actually gives you a good result? And if it does, in what cases? And if it doesn't, you know, what should be done about it? Uh, so it was not a first principle solution of the Maxwell equation. So at the time, it was not even an analytical approximation. So I thought it would be very nice to make it analytical, uh, to take the Maxwell equations and derive the radiative transfer equation from the Maxwell equations and see what it takes, because this process of derivation would tell you the range of applicability. Why is it important? Because so much is at stake. We're talking about the radiation in the atmosphere. We're talking about the radiation balance or imbalance of the terrestrial system. This is a famous NASA diagram, the incoming solar radiation, the outgoing reflected and, and emitted radiation. Do they balance each other? And if they don't, is it plus or minus? Depending on that, there'll be global warming, global cooling. But has this radiation balance problem ever formulated in terms of strict physical terms? And this is important, right? I mean, we, we, we really want to know what the temperature is going to be in 50 years from now. So this, this is an important aspect of demonstrating whether there's global warming, cooling, or there's uh, precise balance. We're talking about radiation, and radiation is electromagnetic, so we have to use electromagnetics for this purpose. Well, let's start with the top level, quantum electrodynamics, because this will help us introduce a parameter, an entity called a photon. So to address this problem in terms of quantum electrodynamics, what we need to do in the classical way, we select a box which encompasses both the sun and the earth. Uh, we write down a Hamiltonian describing the interaction of 10 to the 50 particles with the electromagnetic field. We, uh, quantize the electromagnetic field by imposing boundary conditions uh, on the uh, uh, facets of this box. And then we tend the size of the box to infinity. In the meantime, we have photons, and each of these photons occupies the entire box. So this is quantum electrodynamics. So we need to remember that each photon occupies the entire quantization box. So it's not a localized particle of light. It's not true at all. Well, this is extremely complicated. I know, 10 to the 50 particles. But photons, it's one of the most dangerous and, and really counterproductive notions in, in atmospheric radiation science. Uh, Willis Lem Jr. is a Nobel Prize laureate, one of the great American-born uh, physicists. He discovered the famous Lem shift, which triggered the development of quantum electrodynamics. And this is what he wrote about the notion of a photon in 1995 in his paper, famously called Antiphoton. There's no such thing as a photon. And he's referring to Einstein's paper in 1905. Only a comedy of errors and historical accidents led to its popularity. Well, these are pretty harsh words, I know. But this guy knew what he, what he was talking about. Um, it is high time to give up the use of the word photon and of a bad concept, which should shortly be a century old. So t talking about radiation in terms of particles is like using such ubiquitous phrases as you know or I mean, which are very much to be heard in some cultures. So he, he was famous for being provocative and speaking his mind, and I think it is productive sometimes. Well, what if it is not quantum electrodynamics? What if we use a simpler approach, like the semi-classical approach when you quantize the matter but don't quantize the electromagnetic radiation, then you are stuck with the electromagnetic field and you know that the transport of electromagnetic energy is described by the pointing vector. Now, my question to you is, well, you, you've probably read many papers on the atmospheric radiation balance or imbalance, uh, on, on serious data analysis, and on and on and on. Have you ever seen the words pointing vector in those publications? Probably not even once, which tells you that physics is somehow avoided in those publications. Well, and I think it is, it is really, um, it's really bad uh, because 
physics is what governs the world, the world. And if we say that we can bypass using physics, we are saying that we are smarter than Mother Nature. We can fool it. Usually, you know, it's the other way around, fool ourselves. But in any case, what we have to do is to surround the Earth by an imaginary sphere and integrate the pointing vector over the surface of the sphere if we can do that. So we need to be able to compute the pointing vector from the Maxwell equations somehow. Has not been done. Um, well, can we solve this problem experimentally? In principle, yes. If we have an instrument that measures the pointing vector, we put it on a platform, we launch the platform, one, and yet another one, and many more platforms, you know, Going, syn going synchronously in multiple orbits circling the Earth and measuring the point in vector, then we integrate this and we obtain this final result. So it doesn't take just one platform. I mean, it, it's really a sphere, it's not a single orbit. And so experimentally, this is not done, can, cannot be done because of, of the lack of funding, definitely, and also because there's no instrument that measures the point in vector. Has not, been, uh, has not been designed. Now, instead of photons in the electromagnetic field, we're used to the term specific intensity or radiance. And we owe this uh, term to Lombard, who was at the very outset of, of classical radiometry. So he introduced this notion 250 years ago. And it was repeated by Wolfson and, and Lommel in the first derivation of the radiate transfer equation, and even by Max Planck. Uh, so this is the classical definition of radiance. So notice that the, implicitly the electromagnetic energy propagates simultaneously in all directions. At a given point in space, at a given moment in time. But we cannot use the notion of photons because they're not localized. They're not flying through this point. They occupy the entire quantization volume. And we cannot use the pointing vector because it points in only one direction. It's a vector. It's a monodirectional quantity. So th this is a misnomer by definition. Uh, even, the, the, even the dimension of the pointing vector, it's watts per square meter per second, is different from the dimension of the specific intensity, watts per square meter per second per steradian. Again, we cannot use photons to define specific intensity. And uh, Rudolf Preisendorfer, this is a great book. It's, it's highly mathematical, published in 1865. A lot of mathematics, but then he is really an eloquent guy. So he says there's a big problem because there's a huge gap between physics and, and the radio transfer theory. And he tried to, to bridge this gap. And he said, we need to build a bridge. I mean, he was really eloquent when, when he was saying about this. We need to build a bridge which would uh, connect the mainland of physics with the tiny island of, of radiative transfer. And he said, well, unfortunately, I, I, he had a prediction. Even if this bridge were to be built, there would be very little traffic across uh, for two reasons. The physicists are not so much interested in the subject uh, so they're not paying attention. And the happy aborigines on this island are happy because they're happy already. So they don't really need physics to become happier. Uh, so he tried to build this bridge in his book, and he failed. Uh, because at the very outset, he made a, a mistake in, in the physical derivation from the Maxwell equations. Um, but at least he formulated the dilemma. Uh, and it was not heard, I think. Probably because his book overall was extremely mathematical. It was like a, a, an axiomatic theory of radiative transfer. Um, so I, I really took this as a challenge. And I will not tell you about the details of all of these derivations. But what it really took was to analyze what the instruments that we use do. Uh, and what we use most of the time can be called well collimated radiometers. These are telescopes, radio antennas, or cameras or so the so-called Gershon tube, which oceanographers like so much, even our human eye. These are all well collimated radiometers. And they work as, as direction filters. But they filter not the directions of energy propagation. They filter the directions of wave front propagations, propagations of electromagnetic waves. Again, the subtlety of this distinction is extremely important, but I will not spend time on this. It also took writing several papers and a couple of books to finish this stuff. So 
the net result of all of that research is that we can take the Maxwell equations and go step by step all the way to the radiative transfer equation. We know each step, what is involved and what approximation we make and what the implication of this approximation is going to be. Uh, so this now is an analytical approximation, which is derivable from the Maxwell equations. And using that, we can do two things. We can quantify the measurement of a well collimated radiometer, and we can also compute the time average of the pointing vector. So this is exactly what we need. But all those approximations have been made, and we know what they are, so the, the net result is the radiative transfer equation is only applicable to a homogeneous convex cloud of widely separated droplets. So if we had, if we were interested in Venus, this, this might work because Venus is surrounded by a very thick homogeneous uh, cloud layer. But in the case of the Earth, of course, we're dealing with a much more complex object. We have the surface, we have the ocean interior, we have vegetation, we have clouds, we have aerosols. And the radiative transfer equation for this kind of, uh, of a system has never been derived. So we cannot do that really for the Earth, neither experimentally nor theoretically. But we still use the phenomenological notions of, of radiative transfer. And I was really perplexed by the incredible resilience of, of this phenomenology and why exactly it is so resilient. Well, it's attractive. It uses very simple words, and it was augmented in only one way since the time of, of Lambert by using the word photon incorrectly, unfortunately. Um, interestingly enough, Lambert was also a philosopher, so he introduced this notion of a phenomenology as a simple thing which connects the, the results of an experiment but doesn't look into the origin of, of the problem, uh, doesn't dig deeply into, into the essence of, of the problem. And he knew from the very outset that what he introduced as radiometry 250 years ago was, was a phenomenology. Then 150 years ago, Maxwell you know, designed his Maxwell's electromagnetics. So we knew from that point on that electromagnetic energy, it was electromagnetic waves, not radiances. So even, even if Lambert thought it was fundamental science at his time, it was no longer fundamental uh, science 150 years ago. Now, this, this English translation of the book by Gershon was published in 1936. Again, it's a quote, very telling. Theoretical photometry constitutes a case of arrested development. And I'm talking about 1936. And has remained basically unchanged since 1760, while the rest of physics has swept triumphantly ahead. So this was 1936. Then in 1965, uh, President Doffer again complains about the same thing. And if you open any textbook published a few years ago, it is still the same thing. And so what exactly, you know, what exactly is happening? Why we are so reluctant and, and so stubborn? Um, this is a quote from the famous book by Born Wolf, Principles of Optics. He's talking about Maxwell's electromagnetics. And probably he was referring very specifically to Lord Kelvin, who died in 1907 and still didn't accept Maxwell's, Maxwell's electromagnetics. Uh, they didn't prevent him from installing the first cable between Europe and America. So his electromagnetics, however phenomenological, did work in the engineering sense. But fundamentally, physically, he couldn't accept Maxwell's electromagnetics. Another quote uh, from Kuhn's famous The Structure of Scientific uh, Revolutions. Uh, this is really a famous book, and uh, he claims that most of what we do regularly, you know, routinely, is so-called normal science, which is based on, a, on an accepted, well-defined scientific paradigm. So he writes that normal science seems an, uh, an attempt to force nature into, pre into the preformed and relatively inflexible box that the paradigm supplies. No part of normal science is to call forth new sorts of phenomena. Indeed, those that will not fit the box are often not seen at all. Nor do scientists normally aim to invent new theories, and they are often intolerant of those invented by others. Well, he got a lot of grief for writing this book uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, 
Because scientists, you know, we view ourselves as angels. All we care about is scientific truth, and this is what we're programmed to achieve. And what he's referring to is that, well, we're human beings first, family members second, society members third, members of the scientific society fourth, uh, and scientists fifth, or probably sixth or seventh, I don't know. Well, it's all natural. This is the way it is, and you know, probably we cannot change that. Um, so I did much more research, not just about on, on these two subjects, and I told you about the T-matrix uh, method, and this is kind of a, a happy success story. Uh, now, the, the making of, of the radiative transfer theory and analytical approximation is also a success story, but it is kind of sour, a little sour or bitter. Um, it's no longer an ad hoc approximation, so this is progress, but it is now clear that it became an analytical approximation at the expense of it, making this discipline much more technical, much more mathematical, much more physical, much more complex, and probably much less attractive to many people. Uh, but this is unavoidable. If, if you really want to pursue physics, that's the only way to pursue fundamental things, and you know, we have to use physics. So eventually it will be accepted. Now, what, when the, what happens when the radiative transfer equation doesn't work? Uh, can we do something about it? Can we solve the Maxwell equations? Can we use the first principle approach? Not quite, but there's a, a huge progress. Uh, recently, we were able to use the T-matrix method to solve the Maxwell equations directly for densely packed uh, groups of up to, up to 15,000 particles. This is not your typical cloud, but these are densely packed particles, so we can at least study the effects of packing density, and those are very uh, profound. Uh, but overarching dilemma, I think what this is what we're facing now, and um, we still use a lot of semi-empirical, ad hoc, phenomenological concepts. And this is a really a motley collection of, of things. And to keep this all together, to stitch them together, we use, still have to use so-called simple physical considerations, which is really an acknowledgement that I cannot derive this. So we'll call this physically obvious. Um, now, there, of course, any scientist has many more facets just publishing uh, uh, papers. I have been involved in the organization of these meetings, which have become extremely popular on electromagnetic and light scattering. This is where the first principle physics is promoted. That's the main idea of these meetings. The 14th uh, meeting uh, was held a couple of uh, years ago in Lille in France. Oleg Dubovic organized it, and uh, there were 200 participants. Um, the next one will be in June this year, and Andreas, Mike, and myself, we are organizing it in Leipzig. Um, the 1998 uh, meeting was, was held in New York at GIS, and the result of this uh, meeting was this very popular book, uh, Collecting Monograph on, on Light Scattering by Anospherical Particles. Uh, publishing books is also an interesting business. You know, it is so much unlike publishing a paper. Uh, for example, you can submit a book proposal to five publishers, and this is not a breach of any ethical rules. At the same time, you cannot submit your paper to five different journals. You'll be penalized for that. Uh, I organized a couple of NATO advanced study institutes, which time there was a proceedings volume. Um, there was a, a, a very gratifying and yet at times painful process of, of uh, being a, one of the three editors-in-chief of the Journal of Quantitative Spectroscopy and Radio Transfer. Uh, Pinarmin Gooch, Larry Rothman, and myself, we inherited this journal in, eight, in 2006. It was almost dead at that time uh, for several reasons. So uh, we tried to salvage it, and I think we did rescue it, and we made it a, a very prestigious journal, you know, far more successful than such leading journals as Applied Optics and Journal of the Optical Society of America, A. Um, uh, I also served as, as a project scientist for the Global Aerosol Climatology Project. This is a, a joint initiative of GWAX and NASA, and of course it was funded by NASA. Uh, and the result of this uh, uh, project was a special issue of, of GIS, which alone was uh, cited more than uh, 3,300 uh, 3, uh, times. And of course there was the GLORY mission, which was success in, in the sense that we could build an instrument that we knew should, should have been built, and we knew how to build it, and so we demonstrated that it can be built, and that it performs even better than we expected. 
Of course, the, uh, that instrument only survived five minutes after launch. Um, during these talks, I think we are supposed to emphasize people who influenced us and who helped us and who we owe professionally. And so this is a, an incomplete list of people in addition to those that I have already uh, mentioned. And uh, the traditional sources of funding, it's the Radiation Sciences Program, uh, Remote Sensing Theory Program, and the Glory Mission Project. And uh, Bob Curran, Don Anderson, Hal Mary, and Lucia Tausi have been extremely generous. Um, and now two people who influenced me the most. Uh, the first one is, is Peter Waterman. As I said, he developed the uh, T-matrix method. I've never met him. Uh, he died uh, two and a half years ago. I spoke on the phone a few times uh, with him. Um, he was really your atypical scientist. He never had a, a permanent position at a university. He worked for small companies which were funded by grants from the Department of Defense mostly as a consultant. He was a very shy person, a very low profile and assuming uh, personality. He knew personally very few people and very few people knew him personally. He almost never attended meetings and yet he was sitting somewhere in his house on Cape Cod and, and did uh, beautiful research that has influenced the, uh, this field of research, electromagnetic scattering, in a very profound way. Uh, when he died, uh, his widow, Karen, he, she invited me to come over and just inspect his, his archive, because she wanted to recycle it eventually to see well, whether there was in, anything interesting potentially. So I went through it, and I did discover this report of 1964, and actually a manuscript that accompanied it. Uh, this is what he did. He would first publish a report, usually with the Department of Defense, and then publish this as, as a journal, uh, regular journal paper. In this case, this didn't happen. The report was published, the journal paper was not. I looked at the reviews of, of the manuscript and was submitted to two journals. It was obvious that an influential member of the community, an envious influential member of the community decided to block the publication and so it happened. But in this paper he did no less, no more. He anticipated what is now called the superposition T-matrix method in 1964. Since then, it has been reinvented, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 times in different journals. Uh, but there it was. So we just went ahead and published it as the first paper in a special uh, issue of the Journal of Quantitative Spectroscopy and Radiative Transfer devoted to Peter Waterman and his scientific legacy. So that was extremely gratifying. It was our we were paying debt to him, uh, the intellectual debt to him. And of course, James Kirk Maxwell. Uh, it is almost exactly 150 years ago today that this famous uh, treatise on a dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field was published. Um, and it is because it was published in 1865. The United Nations declared this year, 2015, the year of optics, the year of light. Uh, this is the birth of classical electromagnetics. Um, it is a pity. Uh, this, two pictures disappeared. This was uh, uh, a picture of the monument. You know, Maxwell was really one of the most underappreciated personalities, probably in the history of the entire uh, science. Uh, he was Scottish, and this first monument to Maxwell was erected in his home country in Scotland in 2008. It's it's unimaginable. Uh, this was uh, the reproduction of the first color photograph. Uh, that Maxwell uh, took in, in, 19, in 1861. So he's the founder of, of the discipline of color photography. In addition to determining that the Saturn's rings are not, are not solid bodies, they're composed of chunks of, of ice. Uh, electromagnetism, we have to realize this is the second great unification of physics after Newton's Principia, um, and the first relativistic theory. Uh, he was the, one of the founders, along with uh, Boltzmann, of statistical physics and, and physical kinetics. Any of these achievements would have made him famous, but to, taken together, and especially given the fact that he died when he was 48, uh, this really makes him uh, the greatest physicist ever, perhaps on a par with uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Um, and the physicists, they appreciate this. You know, they really appreciate it. There was a very interesting paper in 2004. Uh, the professor of physics from uh, University of Stony Brook, uh, Chris, he took this poll of a real 
active physicists, not uh, popularizers of science, which equations you think are the greatest in history. And, and Maxwell equations were number one. And there was a huge gap between number one and number two. And for example, the Poincaré Planck, Lewis et al, E equals MC squared, and the Hilbert Einstein equations of gravity, they were not even close in this poll. And finally, two quotes. One is from Boltzmann. In his textbook on Maxwell electromagnetics, uh, he quoted from, from Goethe's Faust. Was it God who wrote these lines? And then Feynman, his famous lectures, uh, uh, from a long view of the history of mankind, seen from, say, 10,000 years from now. There can be little doubt that the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electromagnetics. The American Civil War pale into provincial insignificance in comparison with this important scientific event of the same decade. And the quote goes on, he says also that Maxwell's electromagnetics, in terms of its effect on humankind and the history of humankind, surpasses the combined effect of any 10 presidents or, or emperor, emperors in, in history. So I'll stop at this and will encourage you to use first principle physics and probably it's about time, 150 years, after Maxwell formulated his classical electromagnetics. Thank you. Yeah, so we have time for a few comments and questions. Uh, in our um, real lives, um, even if we have the kind of rigorous theoretical um, basis, and, uh, but we have so many parameters uh, to deal with, and we have so much uncertainty in knowing those parameters, such like the shape of the tree, you know, the distribution of particles, stuff like that. And uh, that kind of stop us from you know, going forward. We just don't know these parameters to um, carry forward the calculations. So how, what do you think? Well, I agree with you. you know, there's nothing more complex. Even Freeman Dyson, he says, that there's nothing more complex than the climate system. Indeed, if you want to describe the system in terms of very first physical principles, you know, like quantum electrodynamics, uh, we cannot do that presently. And probably will not be able to do that, you know, even several decades from now. But I think what is going on is that when you use these ad hoc principles, which are not rooted in physics, and which you can show to be unphysical, and you still use them, you use these ad hoc formulas, and you give these uh, on physical quantities, physical names, it becomes confusing, especially in the sense you never know when your formulas do work and when they do not work. And when you have these ad hoc formulas, you invariably have fudge parameters or tuning parameters, and they multiply. If you take a typical climate model, probably there's a thousand tuning parameters, you can tune your model to reproduce whatever. And the only way to estimate how much of an error you introduce by doing that is going one step up. I'm not saying that we should use quantum electrodynamics. It's at the very top of this hierarchy. But even classical electromagnetics, it is used so little presently. So you have the single scattering properties, and you have the radio transfer equation, and that's all. Everything else you use is phenomenological, semi-empirical, ad hoc. So it's a very limited use. But if you, if you look at the societal value of the scientific problem related to the terrestrial energy balance, we are willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars, to launch all those satellites measuring something and trying to help us determine what the balance or imbalance is. Probably we should use maybe a small fraction of that investment for more basic research, which would tell us what the range of applicability of our ad hoc tools is. This is my only message. I think I've done a little bit of that. Because believe it or not, 20 years ago, everybody believed that no spherical particles are spherical. I had multiple conversations with Jorm Kaufman, and he said, we have this modus data which show invariably that no spherical dust particles coming from the Sahara Desert, they scatter light exactly as spherical particles. Well, you cannot use modus for that. 
it was mostly we want them to be spherical because you know nosphericity is a pain in the neck, right? I cannot imagine the pain that Kunlan Leo experienced in the in the early 1970s when he tried to convince people that ice, ice particles, serious cloud particles, are not Henny Greenstein phase functions. They're real nosferical particles, not described by, by the me theory. Well, now, you know, you say you use the me theory, well, that's not good. You have to use a, a more sophisticated tool because these particles are nosferical. It is all about beliefs, right, in, in some sense. But it, is, it happens at every stage in the development of science. This is a paradigm which we are used to, we are comfortable with it. And making this another step forward and saying, well, what we use is not adequate, or potential is not adequate. We need to clarify the issue, establish the range of applicability. You know, you have to, to do this, make this step, and it needs funding. And it's always the, the matter of funding. Radio transfer theory, uh, you probably didn't make one step further. It is working and working beautifully, and it's uh, verified many folds, with the exception of possibly uh, exactly forward and exact back scattering cases uh, where you worked on. Uh, and uh, my real question is, uh, I, stu I studied physics a long time ago, and I did not read original um, Maxwell paper, but uh, to my recollection, the way Maxwell equations were introduced in textbooks on physics were also phenomenological. There were assumptions, and there were no rigorously, they were not rigorously introduced in this way. Do you see any contradiction with, with, with what you said? Because you're using the same equations, and uh, you, in a way, proving and, and deriving the first principle radio transfer equation. Yes, you're totally right. They were introduced phenomenologically in some sense. But they were first principle equations at the time, because there was nothing more fundamental. There was nothing to derive them from. So they had to be postulated. So this happens in science all the time. You have a collection of experiments, a collection of phenomena that you want to explain in as few equations as you can manage. And Maxwell succeeded. Well, in his treatise, it is like 12 or 16 equations because he didn't use the vector notation. Some of the equations were not independent. And so um, mostly due to, owing to work of, of Heaviside, now we have this system of four equations only. At the time, it was the first principle of physics. There was nothing more fundamental. Then Lorentz said, guys, we can look at, at matter as consisting of elementary particles. Uh, so he formulated what is now called the Maxwell-Lorentz equations of electromagnetism. They deal with elementary point-like charges. So this is a higher level of complexity, and those are more fundamental equations. But eventually, it's, now it is quantum electromagnetics. Uh, that is the first principle theory. Eventually, it will be surpassed by something else. It's just a matter of evolution of, 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 of the structure of, of physics. I really like these talks. It's really good for us to think about these things. Um, outside of non sericity which you, know, you talked about, I think the community is, knows we have to make those type of calculations. But returning to the radio transfer equation, can you provide some practical examples where it appears to break down, at least in the atmosphere, where particles are far enough away that we don't believe there's uh, dependence in terms of the, uh, the phase of the waves, and far enough that uh, there's that mutual uh, cancellation of, uh, of the, the superimposed of the phase function. In other words, I guess I'm asking, I follow what you're saying, and I think it's important that we look at that. But in terms of us as practicing way of transfer folks, in particular, uh, atmosphere where things are a little far apart compared to the radio. Are there issues we should be concerned with? Well, believe it or not, uh, the first experiment, okay, let me start by saying this. There are two ways of verifying the accuracy of the radio transfer equation. One is to use a controlled laboratory experiment. When you have a setting that you ideally perfectly uh, describe and characterize, you know exactly what you're looking at. So you know everything on the macro and micro metrophysical level. You eliminate this medium with the laser beam. You measure the reflected light. And then you compare the predictions from the radiative transfer equation and this measurement. Or you can use more fundamental physics. 
In this case, it's the Maxwell equations like the superposition T-matrix method. And we've done both. So it happens, so it happens that from, from the laboratory experiments, you know, when the packing density of the particles in a particle suspension exceeds 5%, you're in trouble with the radiative transfer uh, theory. 10%, it's definitely outside the range of applicability. But this, uh, you know, in the case of, the, of a cloud, the density is much, much lower. So you, you wouldn't be concerned about the packing density as you would be concerned about the geometry of the cloud and its homogeneity. Because my derivation tells you the cloud must be convex and totally uniform. What if it is not? Okay, so you have two ways of addressing this. Derive the RTE for this highly inhomogeneous, heterogeneous, and uh, morphologically complex cloud. This has not been done, theoretically. Uh, experiments, I don't think you can perform a controlled laboratory experiment or controlled field experiment for a real cloud. So there's no way of verifying the RTE experimentally for these very complex clouds. Uh, in the case of densely packed media, we also did a comparison with the Maxwell equations. Relatively small micro clouds of particles, probably up to 1,000 particles. The, th the theoretical prediction of, of the RTE was very good when the density was 3%. 6%, you can visibly see some deterioration in the prediction capability. But even in the uh, uh, Maxwell equation solver, the model of the cloud was really simple. It was like a spherical, a small spherical cloud. So these are the only ways of verifying the RTE. And uh, I simply don't know how to verify the RTE for uh, morphologically complex clouds or for densely packed morphologically complex media. So we have, all, all we have is hope that it works. This is a follow-up. Can you comment on the use of Monte Carlo techniques to try to get away from having to do a full electromagnetic solution to those problems? Well, Monte Carlo, you know, uh, you should, you should uh, read the very end of uh, Warren Wiscombe's chapter in, in Sasha's book. It's, it's very telling. Uh, there's this Russian school of, of radio transfer and Monte Carlo uh, techniques, which from the very outset they say we are solving the RTE. It is just the Monte Carlo solution of the three-dimensional RTE, nothing, nothing less, nothing more. So it's not a way to bypass the Maxwell equations. If you have a derivation of the radio transfer equation from the Maxwell equations, that's fine. And Monte Carlo is just one of the ways. It's like discrete. Uh, what is it? Uh, you know, adding doubling or um, <laughs> tell me what uh, whiskey and, uh, and the stumness and discrete discrete ordinates just escaping me. Uh, it's just one of the solvers of, of the radio transfer equation. Right, but I was asking in the sense of that does provide a mechanism for looking at these highly heterogeneous mediums, does it not? Oh, it does. It does. But this still implies that the RTE works. And, and again, it has not been demonstrated. I, I don't, don't even know how to do that. There is still no particle interaction effect, so you get close and things like that. But don't exist with Monte Carlo. And it, it uses photons as well. No, no. The moment you use the phase function or the phase matrix, when you apply it to, to a single scattering event, this already means that you're in the realm of radiative transfer. Particles are widely separated. And then there's a bit of hope that they don't have to be uniformly distributed, and on and on. So Sasha, you ready? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. And um, you showed a nice picture of a bridge and small island <laughs> of radiative transfer. And so most of us kind of related to educational procedure at the university. And for young scientists, should we encourage them to build a bridge, or bridge has been already built, or just work on this island uh, of radiative transfer, starting with Boltzmann equation, or so um, has been built, bridge already built? Uh, there's, there's one lane. <laughs> There's just one lane, and, and I described the, the range of its applicability. Yes, the bridge needs to be finalized. Uh, and 
in essence, I think the island itself should migrate and kind of merge with the mainland. It would be a much better solution of the problem. But I totally agree with you. As long as the educational process lags behind, this is a catch-22. And, but I think at a minimum, at the very minimum, the professor should tell the students that since we're talking about radiation, and the radiation is electromagnetic, the very word electromagnetic tells you that you have to deal with this using an electromagnetic theory, be it QED or classical electromagnetics, whatever. And if you don't do that, there are two reasons not to do that. It's complex. And, uh, and, and second, there's some history of it. But at a minimum, you should tell them that this is what you should do. This is what your professor hopes you will do when you grow up and become a scientist. And third, keep an eye on, on the complexity of the issue and the fact that the RT may or may not work depending on the circumstances. And this needs to be classified, clarified, characterized, a lot of things to do. But this should not be taught as a Bible. You should not start with the Boltzmann equations equation as at the outset by saying this is the most fundamental equation. It's not. That's how I was told. And I just curious whether Feynman in Caltech teaching a class of radiative transfer, did he start from Maxwell? He didn't talk. He didn't teach a class in radiative transfer. No, physicists, you know, I, you know I, I attended many conferences where they were physicists. And to them, the radiative transfer is something really inconsequential, very simplistic. It's fake. And uh, they don't trust us a single bit. And th this is a huge gap. So they're arrogant. And we behave like ostriches. There are no problems. And as long as we don't talk to each other, and like Freeman Dyson, right, he is this contrarian. But look, this guy developed quantum electrodynamics. So he's a top-notch physicist. He knows how physics works and how nature works, now, to the best of our collective knowledge. Now, this guy questions what we do in climate modeling and in radiative transfer modeling, simply because it's so indirectly based, or maybe not based at all on, on fundamental physics, to convince them that we know what we're talking about, we have to use their language, because our language is archaic. It is 250 years old. It was archaic even when it was developed. OK, uh, I think that's the end of it. So please, let's give Michael one more round of applause.